Praise the Lord. Uh, greetings today in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Um, it is a privilege to have this opportunity to be here again. Uh, as always, I'm grateful and uh, thankful that those of you who uh, will sign in and become a part of today's broadcast and today's lesson will get a chance to really experience God's goodness and to share with me as I share with you. I uh, do want you to know that I, I um, had a great deal uh, of things to consider the last few days and I'm sure praying for the nation and praying for the transition of power and praying for our government and praying for um, the society at large, just so many things that we have to consider. And um, so I want to greet you all today in the matchless name of Jesus. And I want you to really look at this day as an opportunity to press your way into the kingdom of God. Now, um, <clears throat> I'm not changing up the subject, but I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, how to live out your best version of yourself. But I'm, and I'm going to do it from a very simplified perspective uh, through the Word of God. I want you to pay close attention. I'm not going into nothing real deep. Um, uh, in fact, we're going to be very shallow. There's a way to use the beginning of the year that will really uh, help you to uh, send a signal to yourself about the rest of the year. Sometimes we just talk and uh, we talk about intentions and we never fulfill them. So um, I want to talk a little bit today about how to I'll, we'll just give a few keys to to living out the best version of yourself. Um, I was thinking the other day uh, after I ended the broadcast, I keep telling you that I was going to show you how sometimes I would have these. Uh, ellipses in my spirit, this thing where, wherein I'm praying and believing God for things. And, you know, there are two connotations to the passage that says um, a man's gift will make room for him and bring him before great uh, men. Um, and so, you know, one is the seed we sow. One of them is the gift that God gives us. Uh, that's a, The gift is a seed and there's a gift that we house that as an innate quality that lives within us is our unction to function and uh, there were times in my life when I would simply have needs and not being taught how to uh, retrieve from the grace of God through faith uh, I would just kind of stay before God and sometimes he would give me these pictures and so some of you've seen some of these before but I would just illustrate them and I could do them in like 35, 45 minutes. And this is one. I, would, I had this concept called praying man. And uh, I don't know if you can really see it on the screen. I'm trying to make it uh, available for you here. Some of you have seen this before. Uh, let's see if I can raise it up to the right place here. Got to get adjusted to this camera. Just doing this a few minutes before we start. Uh, there it is. Okay, there's the concept that's... And you're going to notice on each of these illustrations that um, the man has a ring on his hand and he has uh, a finger uh, that has been cut off. I'm trying to get it adjusted here so you can see it. Uh, but he's a praying man. And uh, that's been, you know, my life story, just pretty much praying Spend a lot of time in prayer. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. I'll get it to you. I'm just trying to find where the camera is. So <laughs> you all are okay. So if I put it right here, maybe it'll work a little better. Uh, let's see. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's bring it a little closer. Some of you have seen some of these uh, concepts. Um, but it just shows you how uh, at times God would speak to me and I knew it would be the Holy Spirit and he would direct me to readjust the illustration. And you would be amazed at how 
each of these illustrations would uh, be marketable and would literally sell at strategic points in my life or intervals where they helped me to have um, the type of resourcefulness I needed uh, to really get over some financial hurdles. So um, I've had a great deal of experiences with God pertaining to my personal uh, economy and things of that nature. I want you to understand that even though you may not be an artist, the thing that that God has gifted you to, to do and to be that the innate quality of your own personal housing, um, that's an unction to function that you receive. Um, the Bible says in First John, I think it is, uh, chapter 2, verse 20, and just read all the way down to, I think it's through about verse 27, and you'll see there, it's not just, it's not all about church. It's not all about uh, you and the preacher. It's not all about you and other people. It's, it's really about you and God. It's about you getting in a place with God uh, that allows you to have peace within yourself and peace with God. And that's the most profound thing you can do in life is have peace with yourself, peace and peace with God. But living out the best version of yourself, I'm going to talk about it here at a start at about 12. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to be back and we're going to talk about God and first things. I want to talk about first fruits tomorrow just for a few minutes to help some of you initiate your financial exchanges this year with a trust in God that you perhaps have uh, struggled with in times past. I want to give you the opportunity to hear from scripture um, and I'm going to take my time and just kind of walk through it. Today, I'm not going to be before you very long. I just wanted to kind of encourage you to um, just give you a few keys today to live out the best version of yourself. So if you would also notice that there is a, uh, a code, it's a uh, QR code that's in the corner of the screen. If you take your phone and you put it on the camera, you can actually use that to, and it will, um, I think it will generate the cash app. And you can actually, if you'd like to give, if you desire to give, and I pray that you will begin to sow uh, into the ministry because we're trying to do uh, stupendous things this year in the kingdom of God. And uh, as we sow our spiritual word of reference into your life, we pray that you will sow back uh, natural substance. So we're believing God that uh, you'll take advantage of this opportunity. There is a cash out for those of you who do not have a camera on your phone. You can always refer to the cash out as it is identified on the screen. And just so whatever it is that um, you you are you feel led to to give or to sow. And I I believe that God will bless you. Uh, the Bible says that God loves a cheerful giver. A, a giver who's prompt to give, whose heart is in his giving. And so um, it's very important that um, in the kingdom, we, we really put ourselves in a position where we buy the truth and don't sell it. Praise God. All right. To get started today, I want to give a few keys for how to live out your best version of yourself. Now, to begin, I want to start by saying that the first thing you got to do in order to begin living the best version, the best version of yourself from this perspective is you got to overcome what I call your I can't, C-A-N-T, I can't mindset. You got to overcome your I can't mindset. So let me give you about three passages of scripture here that I want you to write down that I'll be working between Joshua chapter one, verse eight, Mark chapter nine, verse 23, and Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. Mark chapter 9, verse 23. And Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night, that you might observe to do 
according to all that is written therein, and then shall you make your own way prosperous, and you shall have good success. Mark 9, 23, all things are possible to them or to him that believes. And Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, I beseech you, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you might prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Now, overcoming your I can't mindset is um, very important if you're going to live out the best version of yourself. Now, you notice here, Jesus said to begin, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Now, the emphasis here is to learn about uh, something greater than sin. In other words, once you develop a self-conscious, uh, excuse me, a success conscious through Christ, you can actually attain to something that encourages the use of this creative power I keep talking to you about that lives in you through Christ. The Bible says greater is he that is in you than is he that is in the world. So God has given you an influential supernatural implant, a power through Christ, Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is an enablement. It is an anointing. It is an unction to function. So in this, when you learn how to pertain to it, you develop what I call a success consciousness. Now, when I talk about success consciousness, I don't struggle to live right anymore. My mind is already conditioned to righteousness and it's activated by the spirit of righteousness through faith. What I'm saying is that my convictions are now about righteousness not convictions for sin. When I was younger, uh, I used to struggle sometimes with the conviction to sin. And you know, the conviction to sin is to lust and to desire for sin. And that's what I would respond to. Now I have a conviction in righteousness wherein my lust and my desire is to live right, uh, to love, to speak the truth, to do good, to exalt, to encourage, um, to forgive, to do those things. Those are my convictions. They're, they're called convictions in righteousness. So the point here is our continual happiness depends upon the habit of mind that we cultivate. I want you to write that down. My continual happiness depends upon the habit of mind I cultivate. Come on, write that down with me. We're getting started now. My continual happiness. Some of you need daily happiness. You need continual happiness. My continual happiness depends upon the habit of mind that I cultivate. Notice what uh, Philippians chapter 4 verse 8 says, and this is the Apostle Paul talking. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatever is honorable, whatever is worthy of respect, whatever is right, whatever, and confirmed by God's word, whatever is pure, whatever is wholesome, whatever is lovely, whatever brings peace, whatever is admirable and of good report. If there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think continually, he says, on these things. In other words, center your mind on them and implant them in your heart. So it's very important here that you cultivate the habit of mind that you want to live in. Now, I've been talking to you about developing the sense of the possible, and it's the readiness of mind to believe that if God said it, he'll do it. And you know that uh, just like when your eyes see things uh, naturally, it triggers your natural senses. I want you to grow to where when your faith hears a promise, immediately you embrace it as attainable, achievable, something that can be manifested in your life. Receive a promise knowing that if God said it, listen, he who promised is able to perform it. Therefore, he's not, you, you do not have to stagger at the promises of God, but go on with your life knowing 
that after I have obeyed the will of God, I have need of one thing, and that's just patience to wait for what God has promised. Now, in the cultivation of this habit of mind, so that I might be able to um, live and experience the best, this best um, manifestation of myself, I notice that I pray about everything. Uh, and according to God's word, I literally pray. The Bible says in Philippians again in chapter 4, verse 6, uh, do not be anxious or worried about anything, but in everything, and some of you need this today, in everything, in every circumstance, and in every situation, by prayer, notice what he gives here, a specific outline for how to deal with worry and anxiety. He says, by prayer, petition, with thanksgiving, continue to make your specific request known unto God. Now, I pray about everything. I literally don't worry about nothing. There are times people ask me, say, well, how long do you pray about a particular thing? Well, I got this thing called, uh, I pray to peace. Now, since peace is the umpire that caused the plays in my life, sometimes I'll get up with a heaviness or I may feel a little disturbed internally and not be able to put my hands on it. Uh, I may sense something going on in the environment, but not have a distinction relative to what it is. And so I'll pray through the word. I'll pray using my heavenly language. I'll pray, I'll pray in tongues in case you, you wonder about that. I pray in tongues quite frequently. I don't do it on the broadcast because again, you won't understand my language, you know, praying in tongues. So all I do is prove a point that I pray in tongues. So uh, that's something that happens in my secret chambers for the most for the most point. So, but I pray often. Whenever I'm heavy about something, I just I let the Spirit of God just pray through me, and I pray in my heavenly language until I pray to a point of peace, because I know that when peace comes, God is confirming that it is done, that I've got it under control. And sometimes I believe that uh, he's using me to intercede in the heavenly language uh, in a way that I cannot use in my finite mind. So I'll either pray the word of God or I pray in tongues until I feel peace. Many times I pray both ways. So I pray about everything according to God's word so that there's no anxiety in my heart. Let me give you an example. Sometimes um, I don't know, it's just the enemy's way to give you a negative or an evil thought about one of your children or about uh, your personal health or sometimes about your relationships people with people. Being a pastor, sometimes uh, you can hear things and if you don't learn how to restrain your consciousness with prayer, then what happens is, and notice prayer, petition, and with thanksgiving, because I give God thanks for the victory in peace after I or before I leave the issue. Uh, but if you don't learn how to get over these mental hurdles, these mind fights, these thoughts, these suggestions, these imaginations that oftentimes the enemy brings, then it's going to be difficult for you to really contend effectively through righteousness in relationship because it's hard to carry the right behavior into an exchange where you're thinking wrong. Write that down. It's hard to carry a righteous behavior into a situation where you're thinking wrong. I'll say it again. Some of you really need to hear that. It's hard to carry a righteous behavior into any kind of exchange wherein you are thinking wrong. So in order to handle something righteously, you're going to have to think righteously. You can't. You got to get rid of this old thought where uh, years ago we, we was, people would say the spirit made me do it or the devil made me do it. No, 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 no. You got to learn here that he that knoweth not how to rule his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. So I pray about everything. I don't worry about nothing. I don't worry about my health. I don't worry about my wealth. I don't worry about my relationships. I don't worry about uh, sin. I don't worry about people. I don't worry about things. I don't worry. I don't worry. I learn how to cultivate the habit, 
You see, you hear what I'm saying now? I literally cultivate the habit of mind that keeps me righteously aligned with faith so that I can exact from grace through faith in my exchanges. Now, I use prayer. I use specific petitions. And I always give God thanks. There are mornings when, if you are here with me, you notice I walk the floor. I go outside the house. I walk around the house. I go out in the highway. I go to the mailbox. I use those opportunities as a time to just really give God thanks. And sometimes there's an embrace from the spirit realm that's encouragement in the natural, the soul realm, that gives you real rest and peace about issues and about people and about life in general, man. It's very important for you to cultivate the habit of mind that you want to frame your world from. Now, I was asked this question since the last time I was on the air, so I want to also address it because uh, I did not declare a corporate fast as I usually do because I didn't hear God. God didn't say for me to tell the church to go on a corporate fast, but I did go on a personal fast. And let me tell you what I do where fasting is concerned. This may help some of you uh, because it works for me. I fast whenever I notice my flesh trying to dominate my spirit life or, or I, whenever I notice my responses to things are becoming fleshy. Now, it's easy for you to get out of alignment if you're not careful. So there are those days sometimes when you literally have to get up because uh, things require you to respond before you were ready to respond. And you jump up, for instance, you got a carpenter coming over or you've got um, a painter coming over or you've got a contractor, a plumber coming over, an electrician. you got somebody coming over and sometimes they're not good with time. So they'll say, I may come over tomorrow, but they don't give you the time. So all of a sudden, there's a knock on your door. The very day that you plan to sleep in a little longer, they show up, knock it on the door, ring in the doorbell, you jump up, and you haven't really prepared yourself like you are accustomed to. Now, I don't want you to be lost in your rudiment or the, the rudimentary system that we're in. You got to believe now that because I prayed, 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 and meditated, meditated, I'm effective. No, I want you to trust God. But what I'm trying to get at here is I use these as measures sometimes to help me understand when I need to fast. And sometimes what I'll do is just that day declare a fast because I notice my responses are in unrighteousness. For instance, I'll notice my frustration is lingering or anger is lingering longer than it should. Or I may notice that um, I'm trying to start to kind of um, consider worrying about something. <laughs> you know, when I say consider, when you've actually been working through this thing like I have over the, over the span of time that I have, you have to consider worry. And I don't just embrace worry. When I say consider, sometimes I'll look at the enemy moving stations and positions and things in my life that he tries to use as distraction points to cause me to consider. And then consideration depending upon how much I care about those things, will sometimes determine whether or not uh, I open the door for worry. So I'll fast. I'll go on a fast. before I. Because here's the thing I'm trying to get you all to understand. I've got to live in the trust of God. You want to live in the trust of God regardless to what's going on around you. you got to get to where, in spite of what you see on the television, or what you hear doing a commercial about yourself or about a feeling you have or about a pain you have or about a, a thought you have. Listen, you cannot let that be an introduction to anxiety. So what I do when I notice that these triggers are trying to cause unrighteous responses and the way I use the word unrighteous here, align, uh, responses that are not aligned with God's way of doing and being. When I notice that those things are trying to get me to respond out of uh, unrighteousness, then I will fast. So sometimes all I'll do is fast for one meal. I'll, I'll fast one meal a day. Sometimes I'll fast the entire day. Uh, sometimes I'll, I'll say, well, I need to really focus on something and I need my mind to really be 
uh, free from frustration and I need to be able to intensify uh, my efforts of starting with my thoughts towards a thing. And so I'll just simply uh, put the push the food aside. You know, Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone anyway, but by every word of God. You remember now, he was fasting when he said that. So it's very important. You know, you, you see, when you go back to the wilderness, you'll see that uh, and he's the son of God. But as an example, he shows us that the fast helps you to be able to locate the enemy real fast. You know, notice he's able now as he enters into the wilderness, if he's trying to get you and I an anthropological um, point of understanding, he now becomes an example of how that when you when you um, are fasting, you literally see the enemy in the wilderness areas of your life. And notice what he does. He tries to bend your the use of your gifts into something more presumptuous than faith. The Bible says whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So the enemy tries to get you to use your gifts presumptuously. If you, the son of God, turn these stones into bread. No, no, no. I don't have to do that to prove a point to you. So he tries, tries to get you to use your gifts um, to prove a point that's not necessary. That's really the spirit of pride. That's how he initiates pride in our heart. So you got to be careful there. And, uh, you know, Jesus just was not moved by hunger. Uh, in fact, he understood the importance of mind over matter or spirit over mind over matter. That's very, a very important principle. So keep in mind what I've said so far, again here, as it pertains to fasting, I fast whenever I notice my flesh trying to dominate my spirit life or whenever I notice my responses to things becoming fleshly. For instance, even in my relationship with my wife, if I find myself getting short in our exchanges or with my children, if I find myself uh, uh, getting frustrated easy or even with my grandchildren, I notice those things and I use them as barometers uh, to suggest to me that, okay, uh, go ahead and fast, take, take some time, pull back away from the table a little bit and, and uh, get control of your humanity, of your nature. It's very important. Now, the reason why I'm saying this is because when you expect the best, you release a magnetic force in your mind, which by a law of attraction tends to bring the best to you. And that's again within the realms of the sense of the possible. When you expect the best, you release a magnetic force in your mind, which by the law of attraction tends to bring the best to you. Come on, say with me, I expect the best. Moby used to say this, I expect the best because I am the best and the best lives inside of me. And because the best lives inside of me, he demands the best of me. So all of us really need to be expecting the best. And so today's lesson is really about tapping into uh, the realm of possibility or the supernatural by believing before seeing because you got to build this bridge to the things you desire inside of yourself before you're going to see them externally or experience them externally. Now, when you look at the story in Matthew chapter 14, verses uh, 27 through 32, you remember when Peter saw Jesus coming to them in the storm on the water, he was walking on what they were troubled in and troubled by. What Peter actually did was he jumps out the boat at the word of Jesus and he began walking to Jesus on the water, the Bible says. And um, what I want to use that as a bridge to say to you is that he tapped into something that was already there, but because he was not accustomed to living by faith, he was unable to tap into the possibility of impossibilities. So here he tapped into something that was already there. And Jesus here became a prime example of the possibility of faith. Jesus said, faith gives us the ability to do what otherwise we cannot. Now, to begin this year, then using the power of faith, 
here's what I want to suggest to you. If you decide to really achieve something in your life, you will. I'll say that again. If you decide to really achieve something in your life this year, you will. It's all a matter of how you think about yourself and what you think you are actually capable of. I've learned that the power of faith initiated by thought is incredible. It's an incredible thing. So this year, as you begin cultivating the right habit of mind, I want to say that again. As you begin cultivating the right habit of mind, you want to be surrounded by people who influence you, hear me now, to activate your heavenly conscious over your worldly consciousness. Now, that's step number one. I'll say it again. As you begin cultivating the right habit of mind this year, the first thing you need to do is surround yourself with people who influence you to activate your heavenly consciousness over your worldly consciousness. Now, what have I just said? Now, some of you right now, your worldly consciousness is so active because you're watching CNN and Fox Network and you're keeping up with all of the things that's going on externally in the world. Now, God wants you to pray about those things, but not worry about those things. There are some more central and significant things that you literally need to be thinking about. What if I told you in spiritual warfare, Satan uses cosmic supernaturalism to get you, watch this, internally and socially distracted so he can defeat you. It's a point of uh, what we call it deflection. He deflects your attention from what's most important by getting you focused on things least important. Do you realize that only God can solve some of the crises that are in this society? You're not going to be able to solve them, so you might as well pray and learn how to put yourself in the way of godliness through faith so that you can control the things in your life that you, you do have control over. That's why I've often said to you, pray the prayer of serenity. You know, Lord, give me the serenity to accept the things in my life that I cannot change. Give me the wisdom, give me the, um, the courage to change the things that I can, but most of all, give me wisdom to know the difference. Man, discernment, in wisdom pertaining to righteousness will make a big or huge difference in your life. And so it's more important that I pray for the government than it is talk about them and say all kinds of things about them. And some of us have literally gotten ourselves into a posture of worldly consciousness through television that does not allow us to focus on our creative self, the sense of the possible. In fact, if you keep looking at TV and blowing up and allowing it to magnify these situations, you're going to find yourself as a participant in what is going on. Instead of you becoming a solution to the problem, you're going to become a part of the problem. Notice worldly consciousness breeds worldly responses, worldly activity. And that's why a lot of you kingdom citizens right now, it's hard to even talk to you about what's going on in the world because you know what your conversation sounds like? Uh, let I hope this happens to him and I hope this happens to her and I hope, no, 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 that's not righteous thinking. That's not heavenly consciousness. That's not heaven. So you really need to say, Lord, forgive me, cleanse my thoughts, do what Bishop tells me to do, help me to sanitize my thinking in the direction of my hope. Because that's more important to me. That's more central and significant to my life. So it's very important. And I know some of you, I heard, I heard the Holy Spirit just say, some of you took that as a rebuke. It is a rebuke. Because you cannot allow world consciousness to become more important to you than kingdom or heavenly consciousness. How you think determines how you behave. And so if you want to know why your words are so terrible, and unrighteous relative to the government just because of the things that has happened in this country. Listen, it's because that's what you are looking at more of. As faith cometh by hearing or seeing, so does, so does doubt, and so does confusion. 
God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. Now, remember this. I need to have an activated heavenly consciousness. Now, let me say this. Let me swallow first because I want to make this statement and I want you to receive it. Lord, give the people an ear to hear what I'm about to say. Some religious people are messy. They are so messy because they're always introducing unrighteous things into your mind, into your space. You got to be careful how you surround yourself with people this year. People who are always introducing unrighteous mess, things that don't keep you aligned with God's way of doing and being right, things that don't help you directionally to flow into uh, becoming your best self. You got to look, because see, you spend so much time on those things that you burn up your mental energy. Now you're exhausted and it's time to go to bed or time to eat. And now you pertain to other priorities and you never get a chance to, to get back to the things like Paul said, that you should be thinking on. So if they're not going to sanitize your mind in righteousness, be careful because um, when you, you know, you got to surround yourself with people who operate from heaven's point of view more frequently than from the worldly point of view. What that, that point of view determines to some degree now what you're going to believe and what you're going to perpetuate in your life. So it's critical. Make sure that even in keeping up with the uh, transitions of power and uh, President Biden and uh, Kamala Harris, and we celebrate them and we're honored that God has given us new leaders and we're honored that God has given us a man that, that's, begin, that's initiating his campaign with a vision for the nation. Um, and it's very important. But now we got to be righteous enough to take our hearts out of it. Our hearts are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Apart from the word of God, you don't know how to regulate your own heart. Go ahead on and repent and say, Lord, give me the gravity of spirit and the weight of consciousness to obey your word in this season in spite of how I feel and help me pray for our leaders and pray for the government and pray for the president and pray for families and pray for communities and pray for ourselves as individuals and pray for marriage and pray and pray and pray. Men are to always pray and not faint. Lord, help us to pray and not lose heart because of the things that seem to be so out of context. So surround yourself with people who operate from heaven's point of view more frequently than they do from a worldly point of view. Now, my purpose today, as I've said, is to help you live out your best version of yourself. Now, the reason why I came, I wanted to come to you this way is because I know that by the time you were 17 years old, the majority of us uh, had heard, no, you can't, an average of 150,000 times. Isn't that something? Now I'm talking to my grandson and I'm saying to him, do you realize that by the time you turn 17 years old, the average human has heard, no, you can't, an average of 150,000 times. Now you've heard, yes, you can approximately 5,000 times. 5,000 times. Now do the math. That is 30 no's for every yes. You see what we've done? We've heard 30 no's for every yes. That makes a powerful belief of I can't. What if I told you that the struggle that some of you are having right now with the sense of the possible is an I can't struggle? The reason you have an I can't struggle is because it is a seed that was planted in your heart before you became um, uh, a, a heart guarder, someone who guards your heart to make sure that things only go in that you desire to allow in it. Listen, 30 times you've heard no for every yes. And that makes a powerful belief. I can't, I can't. So the first thing you notice in readiness, as soon as a challenge comes, when God tries to give you abundance through thinking, abundance through association, but you're not accustomed to it, 
You think something's wrong with I can't, I can't. Something's wrong with it. Something. You go negative first. See, the scriptures are definitive about the fact that you can change your self-image with the power of thoughts using the word of God for affirmations and using inculcated messages. You know, that's why God would say to Joshua, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night. In other words, go to sleep with it, wake up with it, eat with it. Listen, set it up so that it is everywhere because our beliefs are powerful. Now, they are so powerful uh, in the sense that they dictate our ability to reach our goals. And some of you right now are struggling already. We're just 21 days in and you're struggling to reach your goals that you set, uh, what, January 1st? <laughs> already struggling. Why? Because your beliefs, see, you, you, these beliefs are nothing more than neural patterns, we call them, in your brain. Uh, they're thoughts that are so ingrained that they become automatic thoughts. That's why I, I pointed out to you, you're having 30 thoughts of no for every yes, every thought of yes. And that's why you struggle to believe in yourself and believe in the possibility of God and embrace the promises of God. So I need to clarify uh, that they, 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 they are not there. Your thoughts are not there because, or your beliefs are not there because they are the truth. No, no, no. Your beliefs are there because they've simply been handed down to you from generation to generation. They're there because somebody else put them there. Something else put them there. I read a book one time. Uh, written by uh, Maxwell Maltz. Let me share something with you from that. <clears throat> in 1960, Maxwell Maltz wrote the book Psycho Cybernetics, Psycho Cybernetics, where he talks about the self image we form growing up. He said, We all carry with us a mental blueprint or picture of ourselves. Now, I want you to go back and listen to this uh, after the broadcast is finished because some of you really need to hear what he says here in this book. He says, we all carry with us a mental blueprint or a picture of ourselves. It has been built up from our own beliefs about ourselves. But most of these beliefs about ourselves have unconsciously been formed from our past experience, our successes and our failures, our humiliations, our triumphs, and the way other people have related to us especially in our early childhood. From all these, he said, we mentally construct what's called a self, a picture of a self, a self-image. And once an idea or a belief about ourselves goes into this picture, notice what he says, it becomes true as far as we personally are concerned. He says, then what we, we do not question its validity but we proceed to act upon it just as if it was true. Marx goes on to say that all of our actions, all of our feelings, all of our behaviors, even our abilities are always consistent with this self-image. As such, it becomes very important to change your self-image if that, if that image is one of limiting of a limiting character of some sort. So, he wants us to understand here that if you are now struggling with a self-image that limits your character, limits your belief in the possibility of God's power, that makes it difficult for you to embrace believing that you can. Notice Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who empowers me, who strengthens me, who gives me strength. Listen, or gives me the enablement. And this brings me to one reason why salvation is so important. Now, those of you who are listening to me who've never received Jesus as your Savior, you want to get this because one reason salvation is most important is because the way you perceive and interpret yourself is a result of the belief system you've adopted while you were growing up. It could be a belief that you're not good enough. I know some of you think that or that you'll never amount to anything. Or that it's simply that you'll never do well with sports or that you'll never succeed in your relationship. Any of these beliefs 
are reasons why it's important for you to receive salvation because by renewing your mind, Christ gives you by the power of the Holy Spirit the ability to believe in the possibility of God's power. Herein, you receive the ability to believe in yourself relative to Christ in you. Notice, this is important because uh, we can choose to think as an optimist and have a positive view of life or we can choose to think as a pessimist. I like what Winston Churchill said. He said a pessimist sees the difficulty in every opportunity, but an optimist sees the opportunity in every difficulty. I'll say that again. He said a pessimist sees the difficulty in every opportunity, while an optimist sees the opportunity in every difficulties. Difficulties mastered are opportunities won. So it's very important as I prepare to close that we deal with the problem of doing and being uh, from an intentional thinking perspective. And so let me suggest to you that what you do between now and the next broadcast is that you give yourself what I call some thinking assistances. Now, what I did when I wrote the structure book I sit down, I realized that my thoughts um, needed to be tried because a lot of my thoughts were not acceptable thinking because they were not uh, in righteousness. They did not align with righteousness. And if you want to figure out why your behavior is unrighteous, it's because your thoughts are unrighteous. So you're going to behave like you think. Uh, Proverbs 23 and 7, as he thinketh, so is he or so he becometh. So it's very important here that you give yourself some thinking as assistances. In other words, be realistic about the challenge you have in thinking. And if you have difficulty remembering what's important or thinking strategically, uh, then what you really need to do is find some references. Use the telephone you have, for instance. These little gadgets are good for us. If we use them, go on Google some thinking assistances. Uh, you might be uh, able to pull up something offline that will help you to construct a pattern of thinking for instance, what God suggested for Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 6. He said, here's some thinking assistances that you're going to need. Now, you got to be realistic about this because if you're not realistic, you walk around and you forget what's most important. What are some thinking assistances? He said, um, write it on your over the doorpost, on the lentils. He said, so that um, every time you go in and out of your house, you see what you need to remember. Uh, and when you remind yourself, you're going to develop this sense of spontaneity. You will grow to the point where now you generate this habit of thinking this thing in alignment with what you were trying to do and be. Some people post it on the refrigerator. Some people post it. They put, uh, I've seen men with cards in there. I used to carry cards in my pocket. Uh, I had little um, index cards I would write on. Uh, these were thinking assistances, I called them. And then number two, that's want to keep it real simple today. In order for you to get the best out of yourself, get some planning assistances. Now, I do have some tools, uh, but it's very important. I say it like this. Your mind needs a plan like your spirit needs a vision. And your body needs a plan to hold it in restraint so that you will have something to discipline you, something to pertain to. That's why Proverbs uh, 29, 18 says, where there is no vision or redemptive revelation from God, the people cast off restraints. Nothing will restrain you within the parameters of what you're trying to do and be and accomplish like vision that's made ready. So go ahead. <coughs> Excuse me. If you're having problems remembering Go ahead and acknowledge it. Man, I don't remember. My memory is as short as a peanut. <laughs> you know, uh, my memory is short as a, a potato chip. I don't know. But whatever it is, whatever your memory is, if it's that short, if it's not photostatic like mine, then get you some assistances. Get you some thinking assistances and get you some planning assistances. They will reinforce your life so that you are able to pertain to the thing that you desire to do and be this year. Now, I keep challenging you. I keep saying to you, I want to see you on the other side 
of prosperity and peace. Shalom, where there is nothing missing and nothing broken. But you're going to have to hold yourself accountable to duty and responding. You're going to have to hold yourself accountable to what is right. Listen, all the things that God is telling you to do, I know it sounds like it's all for God, for God, for God, and it is, but it's really God's way of getting his best out of you and getting you to see your best that he's planted in you. God has planted some great things in your heart, and this year, you need to see them manifested, and I pray that all of you remain convicted until you see God's glory manifested from your life. I want to see God's glory oozing out of you this year. This is your year to be the greater you. This is your year to manifest God's glorious you. This is your year to pertain to the righteous you. This is your year to live as the more than the conqueror you are. Greater is he that is in you than is he that is in the world. And because he lives in you, you can do all things through Christ who gives you the enablement, the empowerment, the strength, the wisdom, and the revelation to do so. You have everything you need for life and godliness. Let's be about the business of manifesting our best self 2021. Look out, here we come. We will show the world who we are through Christ because this will be our best year yet. God bless you. Please don't forget uh, the QR code that's on the screen or the cash app is already there for you, for you to identify. Listen, don't hesitate to sow. Sow, sow, sow. Seed where your faith is and trust God and come back and testify and let Bishop know that when you sow into good ground, that good things happen in your life. And I want to hear your testimonies about how God has manifested his glory through your seed. Remember, I'll be back tomorrow at 12 noon, and I'm going to talk to you about God and first things or first fruits. God bless you. Have a glorious day in him. I'll see you on the other side of prosperity and peace. Praise God.